London 1621. In the light of a lonely candle, Thomas Munn hastily scribbles away at the white pages. England is in the midst of a harsh depression, brought on by English manufacturers being outcompeted by cheap goods from India. Enraged by this state of affairs, the ire of the English public is aimed at what is thought to be the crisis main culprit, the East India Trading Company. As the company's director, Moon is in a desperate struggle to clear his name, as well as that of the corporation. And in doing so, he writes a work which not only manages to save the company, but in which he establishes the first formulation of an intellectual stream that would come to dominate Western economic thinking for nearly two centuries. Mercantilism, the economics of empires. The immediate problem one runs into when writing a history of mercantilism is that it's not really obvious where to begin. The term itself was never used by any of the people it's associated with, and one could also argue that a mercantile economic practice existed before the existence of any sort of mercantile theory. As usual, we will try to tackle the history of mercantilism by trying to place it within its historical background. Trade, craftsmanship and industry have been domains that for most of western history have been under strict regulations. As Europe entered into the high middle ages at the turn of the millennia, the right to carry out trade or craftsmanship such as smithing or tanning, was often restricted to a special sort of people living in the cities. This way, the people with the right privileges could avoid unwanted competition, while the crown could control and tax trade more easily. With the rise of the modern state, the power of Europe's monarchs gradually started to increase, and with it, the fingers of the state grew deeper into Europe's early modern economies. Since trade and industry, to some degree, always had been regulated since the Middle Ages, it's not easy to draw a clear line from when mercantilism is supposed to have emerged. However, while the line may be blurry, I think the best time to point to the establishment of what traditionally have been seen as mercantilism is in the early 17th century, since this is the age when I think we can truly speak about a somewhat coherent stream of thought that can be called mercantilism. It is also from the early 17th century forward that this stream of thought starts to heavily affect the economic policy of many early modern European states. So what was this stream of thinking? And what effect did it have on early modern European economic history? Early modern mercantile economics was centered around two main pillars which were heavily intertwined. The establishment of a positive balance of trade and a heavily regulated domestic economy. Trade and its effect on a nation's prosperity was a primary interest among early modern mercantile thinkers. Trade has the potential to enrich a country and make it stronger, but at the same time it can also harm a country's economy and thus be a detriment. In order for trade to enrich a nation, the land needs to have a positive trade balance in which the country's exports are higher than its imports. If this is the case, the nation's industries will be strong and able to make more profit that can be taxed by the government. If the balance of trade is negative, however, the land's industries will be weakened and eventually outcompeted, with money and capital flowing out across the borders into foreign countries. This attitude towards foreign trade has often been characterized as bullionism, 
That is, defining a country's wealth based on the amount of capital and precious metals it's able to accumulate. That is, however, a mischaracterization of mercantilist economics. Very few, if any, early modern mercantile thinkers defined a nation's wealth this way, and many of them were well aware of the dangers of hoarding capital. To the mercantilists, the influx of capital was something a country should aim for, yet it was only considered a positive provided that the wealth was reinvested into the nation's industries, something that clearly manifested in the mercantilists analysis of the downfall of one of early modern Europe's greatest empires, Spain. Through its exploration and colonization of the new world, Spain had established an expansive overseas empire, from which mountains of gold and silver were shipped back to the mother country. Something that many mercantile thinkers were quick to point out, ultimately, would not be to Spain's benefit. The influx of precious metals caused Spanish prices to skyrocket which in turn created incentives to import cheaper products from abroad. In addition, did many mercantile thinkers also recognize that Spain's static feudal system made it next to impossible for Spanish industries to flourish. Since its founding, Spain, like several other early modern countries, was an absolute monarchy in which the power of the king, in theory, was absolute. In practice, however, this state of affairs came with a heavy price, for in order to have its power recognized by the Spanish elite, namely the Spanish nobility, the crown had to swear to protect the nobility's rights and privileges. This resulted in large swaths of the country being owned by aristocrats, who preferred to use the land as rental income for serfs and tenant farmers. The aristocrats' use of the land made Spain more prone to export raw material like wool and agricultural products, rather than invest resources into industrial innovation since such investments could give rise to a strong middle class that would threaten the nobility's hegemony. This state of affairs created a rather bizarre situation in which Spain possessed Europe's largest colonial empire, while at the same time practically being a colony in relation to Europe's other powers. A poor, underdeveloped country that exported cheap raw material while importing expensive manufactured goods from its rivals. Something that is frustratingly reflected in the words of a 17th century Spanish mercantile thinker. In order to secure a positive balance of trade, mercantile thinkers shunned the idea of free markets and instead advocated for high tariffs on imported goods as well as for the creation of new laws and regulations to make it harder for merchants to import foreign products. An example of such a law was the English Navigation Act of 1651, which among other things prohibited foreign merchants from selling goods in British harbours that were not from their home countries creating a situation in which French merchants only were allowed to import French goods, while Dutch merchants only were allowed to import goods from the Netherlands. Another strategy that several European powers used to improve their balance of trade was by seizing foreign land in America and the East Indies by establishing colonies. Through acquiring colonies, countries like England and Holland controlled territories that they could force to specialize in producing raw material like cotton and sugar to sell to their mother countries, while at the same time functioning like foreign markets to which the motherland's industries could sell their industrial products. 
a tool that several early modern states used to establish and maintain colonies, as well as trade with distant countries, was national trade companies, such as East India companies and African companies. These trading companies received considerable privileges, as well as subsidies from their respective states, to establish and maintain trade with distant countries that would be to the benefit of their mother country. Unlike modern corporations, the mission of early modern trading companies was not simply to conduct trade, but also, if necessary, to force foreign states to partake in it. This is well reflected in the sheer military might that some of these companies managed to amass. The most notable example being the English East India Trading Company, which at the height of its power in the late 18th century is estimated to have possessed a military force numbering around 200,000. In order to create a positive balance of trade, mercantile thinkers thought that it's not only necessary to protect domestic production, but that it's also necessary for the state to take measures to strengthen the nation's industries. In modern economic thinking, competition between different corporations is generally thought to be positive for economic growth since competition incentivizes innovation and efficiency. This is a view that few mercantile thinkers shared. Instead of viewing competition as a boost to economic growth, a free domestic market was believed to lead to the creation of many small companies that all would be too inefficient to be profitable due to an imbalance between the amount of employers and employees. If a town, for example, had too many factories, the mercantilists argued that it would lead to a situation that would enable workers to demand higher salaries, which the mercantilists in turn thought would lead to domestic industries being unable to undercut foreign competition, and thus be unable to make profit. To avoid this situation, mercantilist thinking prescribed that the nation's economy needs to be heavily regulated, especially when it came to the number of factory owners in each town and in each industry. This led many early modern states to create special privileges that were required to run a factory in a certain industry. In addition, did many states also give out favorable loans and subsidies to the country's industrialists, with the intention that the money would be invested in the business. With a regulated market and great sums of capital, the mercantilists argued that the land's factory owners would be able to invest in better technology and learn how to improve production in a way that was needed to compete with foreign competitors. In addition to having industries regulated, mercantile thinkers also argued that the nation's guilds needed to come under the control of state regulation, which led to the creation of several new laws controlling the amount of guildmasters and apprentices allowed by the state. Beyond the guilds and the industries, early modern mercantile thinkers were also interested in agriculture. Unless a nation's agriculture produces enough food to feed the country, it would need to import food from other countries, which in turn would jeopardize a country's self-sufficiency, as well as be negative for the balance of trade something that the mercantilists could not tolerate. While mercantile thinking primarily was focused around industries, there always existed some interest in agriculture, which would become particularly strong in the 18th century. It needs to be noted that the relationship between industries and agriculture was not one of mutual exclusion. Since mercantilism mainly was prevalent prior to the Industrial Revolution, 
There never existed any question regarding whether a country primarily should be an industrial or an agricultural country. Both industries and agriculture were needed for a country to be prosperous in mercantile economics. Since the Middle Ages, European agriculture had primarily been focused on self-sufficiency, which meant that most farmers mainly grew crops to sustain themselves and pay taxes. While some agricultural products were sold on the market, the system can hardly be considered commercial agriculture. In order to change this, some mercantile thinkers argued that the state should work to merge the land swaths distributed among the peasants into large arable land areas that could be run by fewer people who would be able to innovate the agricultural production by adopting new farming technologies. This would in turn increase the nation's food production, which in turn would increase the nation's workforce, as well as strengthen the state by enabling it to mobilize more resources and recruit larger armies, which in many ways is the end goal of mercantilism. When mercantile thinkers thought of a nation being rich and prosperous, they mainly referred to the prosperity of the state, in terms of its ability to dominate and protect itself against other states. The well-being of workers and the common folk was secondary for most mercantile thinkers, and some even went so far as to claim that the poverty of the working class was a requirement for a country to be powerful. A final aspect of mercantile domestic policy that I think is relevant to bring up is that of work specialization. In order for the different economic sectors in society, like agriculture and manufacturing to be efficient, mercantile thinkers argued that they needed to focus on different things and not tread outside their designated fields. This tendency became prevalent in several European countries in the 18th century, and especially when it came to the relationship between cities and the countryside. In the Middle Ages and much of the early modern period, many European cities had owned the farmland surrounding the city in order to make sure that the city would be able to feed its inhabitants. In similar fashion did most farmers conduct minor craftsmanship during the winter months, when they didn't need to work in the fields, like creating their own tools and sewing their own clothes. This state of affairs angered many 18th century mercantile thinkers who condemned the common folk's multitasking for preventing work specialization in the economy and thus being a detriment to the nation. While there wasn't any way to outlaw the farmer's home craft, the mercantilists in some countries were able to affect the city's agricultural production. An example of this is the Swedish government, which in the 18th century prohibited its cities from purchasing new farmland to support themselves when they expanded. While trade and domestic economics are important subjects to understand mercantilism, in order to fully get a sense of the mercantile rationale in the context of early modern Europe, it's necessary to cover some of the underlying ideological streams of thought that mercantile economics is associated with. As you probably have noticed, did many mercantile thinkers view workers and the common folk very unsympathetically. A man working in a factory should, according to the mercantilists, not be given the opportunity to argue for better wages or be able to start his own company. Nor should he be allowed to save money by producing his own food and necessities. This unsympathetic view towards ordinary people is closely tied to the elitist views of society that dominated large parts of Europe, 
throughout the early modern period. Common people, such as peasants and workers, are generally seen as simple, greedy and naturally inclined to act on irrational impulses at the expense of their nation. The elites, on the other hand, which is to say the nobility and the wealthy burgess, are in contrast instead thought of as rational, virtuous, well-educated and able to see the greater picture and thus able to prioritize the country's long-term interests. In order for a country to be prosperous, the ill-guided will of the common folk needed to be curbed by the elite, and if the elite left the commoners to their own devices, it was generally thought to lead to disarray and disaster. Similarly to how a young child would hurt both itself as well as the people around it if left without the guidance of good parents. As such, the economic aspirations of the common folk were seen by the mercantilists as something that needed to be restricted by the state for the greater good of the nation. Another prominent idea that mercantile economics was closely tied to was the idea of the state society. That is to say, the idea that different people have different tasks in society that are determined by their social class, which they, except in the rare circumstances, are born into. This is especially reflected in how the mercantilists emphasized that only certain people should have the right to become factory owners, similarly to how only some people were allowed to be nobles or guild members. The last, and according to me, usually least emphasized ideological stream associated with mercantile thinking is that of the foreign affairs theory called realism. The theory dates back to at least the 5th century BC, and while it did not become an officially formulated theory until the 20th century, it is well reflected in much early modern political writing. In this view of international relations, the global system is characterized by anarchy, with different states competing against each other for power and survival. In such an environment, any sort of transaction is zero-sum, and there is no room for peaceful cooperation. The way this thinking corresponds well to mercantilism is in the way mercantilists emphasize that trade and economics is zero-sum. If one actor wins on a transaction, the other must necessarily be worse off. While the principles of mercantilism would be unchallenged in European economic thinking throughout most of the early modern era, mercantile economics would not reign supreme forever. By the mid to late 18th century, there started to emerge a growing stream of criticism towards the mercantile system, with many people arguing that it had several severe shortcomings. The most famous of these critics was the 18th century economist Adam Smith, who, in his famous book Wealth of Nations, gave sharp criticism against mercantile economic thinking. His first critique, which is actually a misunderstanding of mercantile economics, is that the nation's wealth is not measured by its amount of gold and precious metals, but by its amount of goods and products. As pointed out in our coverage of the mercantilists' analysis of Spain, is this something that the mercantilists did not believe? Though it's understandable why Smith would think this, given the mercantilists' heavy emphasis on the influx of capital and a positive balance of trade. The way Smith would associate mercantilism with bullionism would stick, however, and has been part of the understanding of mercantilism within intellectual history until the late 20th century. 
Smith's second critique of mercantilism is that trade between different countries is not a zero-sum game, but something that will benefit both parties. Free trade, Smith argued, would lead to countries specializing in different things, which will lead to all countries receiving more goods, and thus be wealthier. This is a critique that Smith was not alone in. Similar critiques were given by many 18th century economists, who pointed out that the heavy tariffs and harsh restrictions on foreign merchants led many countries' industries to not having enough people to sell their goods to, since the tariffs led to fewer trade ships deciding to dock in foreign harbors. One final critique given to the mercantile economic system was that the heavy regulations and the generous benefits given to a select few industrialists did not actually benefit the country, but instead was a sign of corruption. Many economic thinkers, as well as politicians, argued that the system of privileges and benefits seldom was given out with the intention to improve the country, but instead functioned as a way for corrupt politicians to benefit their associates. As the 18th century passed into the 19th century, the crowd of critics grew, and with revolutionary transformative events like the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars, the old mercantile economic system came to give way to economic liberalism, both on an intellectual level as well as in practice. Not only did the critics give scathing critiques to the outcome of mercantile economics, but they also think an important factor to the fall of mercantilism is the gradual collapse of the intellectual currents it's associated with. The late 18th and early 19th century did not simply see the rise of economic liberalism, but also the rise of the idea that ordinary people are citizens with universal rights, and that citizens have a right to have a say in the affairs of state, rather than simply being subjects whose desires should be controlled by the state. In such an intellectual climate, it's much harder to argue that some people should have the legal right to own a factory, like it would have been throughout most of the early modern period. 